Thank you very much, George. Um, for those who don't know where we are, if you're passing through London any time you see this glass building uh, near the uh, London Eye, then this is where our hospital is, very central within London. Just to give you a background and what the sort of service I, I'm going to base part of my talk around, uh, we have a fairly large uh, fetal cardiology service and we will be delivering two to three babies each week at our centre with antenatally diagnosed congenital heart disease. The, I'm not going to cover, for those who were at the workshop, which we did yesterday, we covered the precise sonographic approach to uh, screening for congenital heart disease during fetal life, and I'm not going to revisit that. It suffice to say that in experienced hands, uh, prenatal diagnosis of congenital heart disease is very accurate indeed. And in the literature, virtually every type of congenital heart defect has been described during fetal life. But there remain very significant cha challenges in terms of screening for congenital heart defects. This tends to be the pattern followed in many countries is that for uh, in most pregnancy, uh, mo those pregnancies judged to be at low risk for congenital heart disease are scanned initially with their uh, uh, standard anomaly scans and referrals made for more detailed assessment only with the specific concerns or else they are triaged into high, a high-risk population uh, where there are pregnancies that are known to be at high risk for congenital heart disease. And those sort of things, not exhaustively, but those sort of things include fetal factors, notably abnormal screening views of the, of the heart, increased nucleotranslucency, and extracardiac malformations and high drops and along with some uh, uh, historic risk factors such as maternal diabetes mellitus and family history of congenital heart disease. However, if you look around the world, the detection of congenital heart disease uh, on screening remains uh, fairly highly suboptimal. And a lot of this relates to uh, the, uh, essentially to operator training and experience and a variety of other factors, including the types of equipment being used, the time allocation for anomaly scanning. And you'll see, this is even within the UK, you can see the dark blue is a low detection rate and the red, dark red, are, and red colors are higher detection rates, even within a fairly develop, within a develop, a developed country with a fairly well-established network, there's major regional variation in this in practice. And the impact of training, this is a quite a nice slide from uh, several years ago, really illustrating what we all know quite well, is that if you're trained, then your, your diagnostic acumen will increase, but there's considerable individual variability in terms of the ease with which people learn how to screen the heart, and the people continue to find this area reasonably difficult. And this is particularly important because for the, those shown in pink here, most cases of congenital heart disease being identified in a low-risk population and continuing to be identified through standard uh, uh, anomaly scanning, typically mid-trimester anomaly scanning. Sorry. Now, for any screening test, uh, what we prenatal diagnosis is allowing us is an accurate diagnosis of the index lesion. I'll come back to that identification of associated abnormalities, parental decision-making, and then moving on, I'm going to say a little bit more about this, is about informed consent for surgery and interventions and in, uh, preparation for delivery and postnatal therapy. In a minority, but uh, a relatively small minority, prenatal diagnosis affords, it gives us an opportunity for uh, prenatal intervention. And I think from where we sit, we're one of the few fetal subspecialist groups where if I diagnose a fetus prenatally, I will continue to manage them after birth. So you, you extend your practice into postnatal management, which is quite important in terms of the uh, prognostic implications and ongoing management. Now, sticking with um, the uh, diagnosis, accurate diagnosis is really the cornerstone and as comprehensive a diagnosis as possible. Uh, in, uh, very important to be aware of diagnostic limitations. And I'll just give a few examples in a second which are important for practice. 
and knowledge of the potential associations. So for each cardiac lesion, really accurate knowledge of the potential associations. So if I show this one just as an initial example, this is a fetus with uh, transposition of the great arteries. Now this is a standard four chamber view and you look at this four chamber view and say this looks pretty normal and indeed it is normal. So the four chamber view in the, for this lesion is, uh, 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 is normal in the vast majority of cases. But when we come to look at the outflow tracts here, you can see that leaving the left ventricle is a branching vessel and from the right ventricle a non-branching vessel. So this is the prenatal sonographic appearances of transposition of the great arteries. And we would expect for this lesion to be able to identify the major or the components of the abnormality accurately before birth. What we can't do is always predict which baby will run into immediate problems with severe cyanosis after birth. So we have made the diagnosis, but the implication for our delivery and neonatal staff, there is a degree of doubt as to exactly how sick, how cyanosed this baby will be after birth. And this degree of um, uh, inevitable, essentially, uh, um, hedging of bets and range of possibilities comes into the discussion. If you look at the associations, again, relating to a specific lesion, and this is our series, and you can match it with many others in the literature, for simple transposition of the great arteries, it is very unusual for there to be an associated chromosomal abnormality. And external e extra cardiac abnormalities, whilst they can occur, they are the exception rather than the rule. So having knowledge of that is important in terms of the uh, f family counselling. If we switch ahead and look at a different lesion, this is tetra Tetralogy of Fallow, where we see the VSD with the aortic override and variable degree of subpulmonary obstruction. Then here we can see again the left ventricle here, right ventricle, we can see the overriding of the aorta, the aorta overrides a ventricular septal defect. So this part of the diagnosis in experienced hands should not be a major challenge. We can see again here nicely the aortic override above the ventricular septal defect. What is difficult is you can see in this fetus, these in here are very, very tiny. There are tiny central pulmonary arteries. So the areas of diagnostic doubt can come over how adequate pulmonary blood flow will be after birth. Will this baby be dependent on prostaglandin E after birth? Will this baby need an early intervention? Are these pulmonary arteries all joined together or are they separate and disconnected? All of these things affect the prognosis, but they're very, very difficult for us to tell prenatally. Postnatally, we have access to things like either CT or MRI scanning where we can get more information, but in terms of pre uh, parental uh, counseling, we may not have all necessary information to hand. And the risk profile in terms of extra cardiac abnormalities is completely different. So tetralogy of fallow is very frequently associated with uh, extra cardiac abnormalities, whether structural or chromosomal, and a variety of other miscellaneous syndromes, some of which we can identify with uh, detailed sonography, other which can't be identified with detailed sonography. So being uh, very clear about the limitations of what we can actually say is, is, is important. So, one of the classic diagnoses, as well as associations being difficult, some of the actual diagnoses themselves are extremely difficult, and probably the one we're worst at is prenatal diagnosis of coarctation of the aorta. Um, if we look at that in particular, this is a kind of a, a, a sort of simplified diagram of the fetal circulation. Sorry. The simplified diagram of the fetal circulation, and you can see that during fetal life, both the right and left ventricles are pumping to the systemic circulation, and the arterial duct is patent. And it's in this region of the arterial duct that the coarctation shelves develop. And for some of these cases, although we get supportive signs, we may not be able to either confirm or refute a diagnosis until after the baby is born. So if we look at some supportive signs, you can see in this four-chamber view, the right ventricle is larger than the left ventricle, and we can, you get a similar discrepancy usually as far as the arteries are concerned. So here would be an example of uh, where we would suspect 
Here you can see small left heart structures, much bigger right heart structures. But this is not hypoplastic left heart as such because there is anti-grade flow across the mitral valve and tricuspid valves. So this heart is normally connected, but the proportions are wrong. And when you look up here towards the aortic arch, this is a transverse aortic arch and pulmonary artery, then the transverse aortic arch is probably a half or third the size of the arterial duct. And it's this type of comparison view which we're using to infer a diagnosis of coarctation of the aorta. We don't see it obstruct in the same way as happens after birth. So how good are we? This is some data we put together from about seven years ago where you can see of the babies where we said, this is for any baby in whom we said we want a postnatal echocardiogram because of any degree of suspicion of coarctation. So this includes very low suspicions, includes all of them. But you can see that we are needing, we need to, um, some of these babies we've raised a question of coarctation which will not be confirmed after birth. We confirm it in, uh, 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 in uh, the remainder. Some of these present early when the duct closes, but a significant minority may not, be, we may, may not present for several weeks or months well after the arterial duct is closed. So these are babies that need to be followed and followed serially in clinic to exclude coarctation. For, <clears throat> so in general, some, sometimes postnatal scanning is necessary to confirm or refute, and we can't always be absolutely categor categoric. Coarctation of the aorta is, a, is an example of, where is, is it there, yes or no? But other examples, ventricular septal defects, we won't for sure, in most cases, or in many cases, know the significance of a ventricular septal defect until after the pulmonary vascular resistance falls after birth. So we may be waiting four, six, eight weeks before we can be absolutely sure or get further information about whether this is a defect we should be closing or whether we can treat uh, 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 conservatively. So unfortunately, it's a rather paradoxical message here, and that is I think that as, as you get more experience and as you do more, you sometimes actually become less confident and less dogmatic about the prognosis and more clear about uh, uh, the potential surprises and some of the uncertainties which can happen. You can see from all of these sort of uh, 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 illustrations, and particularly with non-cardiac abnormalities, is that if you're uh, in my position, you can't do this on your own. You need your friends in terms of fetal medicine specialists geneticists, obstetricians, and neonatologists. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those gr groups in turn as we, go, as we go through. Underpinning this, we don't, even in a kind of subspecialty such as ours, it's really important to get the full picture. Is this an isolated congenital heart problem or is this part of a much bigger picture? And that's really where you're working in teams, where you know the strengths of each part member of the team. So, for example, with me, I'd be working very closely with the fetal medicine specialists and geneticists to try and work out this full picture. And some of the extra cardiac abnormalities dramatically impact on prognosis. So, for example, congenital heart disease plus diaphragmatic hernia is more than the sum of the parts. The same with exomphalos. They interact and are synergistic in terms of affecting the prognosis. And the impact of premature delivery is something which we need to address as well. So if we look at, for example, at preterm delivery, complications of pre prematurity loom large. They loom even larger in babies who have additional congenital heart defects as their abnormal hemodynamics may aggravate or promote many of the conditions which we're seeing here. And in some situations, if you're looking at a size, uh, 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 pure size effect, you may have to be concerned about how big a baby has to be before you can place them on cardiopulmonary bypass. So you have to be certain about that in your institution and certain about it with things like estimations of fetal weight. As far as prognostication is concerned, where I think the fetal cardiologist really plays a central role is in the prognosis. And this will vary a lot in terms of some of the uh, uh, very specific, you know, individually specific prognoses as far as one can tell. Much of the data we have from the literature records in terms of 30-day or, you know, 30-day, 60-day in-hospital survival. 
and the type of questions which you ask by parents are rarely 30-day survival. What they will be asking is about, will my child make it to the age of 5, 10, 15, 20? And if they do make it to that age, what's their quality of life going to be like? Never mind whether they're alive or dead, but what's their quality of life going to be like in the longer term? And I think it's that situation where the fetal cardiologist really needs to be the kind of honest broker as far as the, uh, that type of information is concerned and be up to date with this type of uh, uh, information. In terms of moving ahead now to this kind of neonatal and perinatal management, the first line is something which people always trot out, but communication, without good communication, you are uh, lost here. Absolutely, ser uh, uh, absolutely essential to have good communication and meet regularly with those who will be involved postnatally. Um, potential early neonatal complications. What about immediate postnatal complications? How big a team do you need? Do we need people there ready for the whole neonatal, perinatal team? Do we need to drain effusions? What are we going to need to do after this baby is born? Location of delivery. Is this a baby that can be safely delivered at their local hospital or should be delivered at a tertiary centre? What is the likelihood of needing early neonatal intervention, both from a cardiac perspective or a supportive perspective? And awareness of variabilities within the diagnostic group. Many parents will go off to the internet, they'll look up a specific lesion, and they'll come back at you with a prognosis of a specific lesion as if it's all one group. It's very rarely one group. I'll give you one, just a few examples. I can't cover everything, but one or two examples. So, for example, this is an example of an atrioventricular septal defect. In this particular case, important things in terms of associations are clearly major trisomies, particularly trisomy 21. But if this baby has good valvar function and no obstruction to the aortal pulmonary artery, we would not expect this baby to run into early postnatal difficulties. We would not expect high-level intensive care to be necessary immediately. And so in some situations here, these are babies who will deliver at their local centers with liaison with their local teams about where they will be delivered. Another example, which is a good example, not so common, but it's a good example of variability in terms of prognosis. So this is Epstein's anomaly with an abnormal displacement of the tricuspid valve. And again, just uh, please don't kind of work your way through this slide. But this is a far from simple hemodynamic situation. We have problems of heart loading, cardiomegaly. This can lead to true compression or hypoplasia of the lungs, lack of anti-grade flow into the pulmonary arteries, hypoplasia of the pulmonary arteries or even atresia of the pulmonary arteries, stretching of the atriums and accessory electrical pathways with a potential for arrhythmia. So this leads to a quite a complicated uh, hemodynamic implications of this di di diagnosis. This is an example here where you might look at this and say, what's wrong here? If you look very carefully towards the apex, you can see tricuspid regurgitation down here. And in fact, the tricuspid valve is right down at the RV apex. There is no tricuspid valve in the usual place. But this, we would regard as probably at the milder end of the spectrum. When we look at this example, we're seeing here now the heart virtually filling the chest, the lung tissue squashed to the back. This big black area is all of the hugely dil dilatation of the right atrium. And when you're seeing these babies with wall-to-wall -wall heart, you can see the squashing in here of the left ventricle. These are the babies where you potentially need a major neonatal early resuscitation with aggressive ventilation, oxygen, and drugs to reduce pulmonary vascular resistance. So a completely different scenario from the earlier example of the same condition. Some of these things, and this is just something we published over scoring systems for this particular lesion. So trying to adjust within a specific lesion to prognost prognosticate as far as these are concerned. And awareness of the potential clinical complications after birth. And the plan if or when these things arise so that you're kind of forewarned about what will be maybe happening. And again, if you look at the sort of scoring system, the predictive ability with the non-survivors here in black and the survivors in varying according to their scoring. So, within tetralogy of fallow, there may be variability in terms of the anatomy as well, with a variable degree of pulmonary obstruction. Again, 
uh, uh, may impact on where you deliver versus locally or at the Katarshi Center. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome, example of hypoplastic left heart, not all the same. Importantly here in terms of the weather, how good the communication is between the atriums to allow blood to flow back from the lungs into the systemic circulation. Does this impact on outcome for some lesions? And this is from uh, several years ago. There's clear evidence of an impact on prognosis. So for hypoplastic left heart, better prognosis with antenatal diagnosis. Why is this? Avoidance of acidosis. Better valvular function, ventricular function, avoidance of needs for inotropes, et cetera, et cetera. So better condition. And very importantly, aside from life and death matters, neurological morbidity and more, uh, in this group with a better neurological outcome for, for fetuses who are diagnosed prenatally. In a minority, we're looking at an, 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 uh, at an opportunity for intervention. So again, coming back to the atrial septum in hypoplastic left heart, these are some of the, where we're looking at potential interventions to open up the atrial septum, but this is in a minority of groups. And if we look at the prenatal intervention categories, green for well-established, orange for kind of more controversial, and red where it's not really got convincing data, arrhythmia is a standout prenatal intervention and a few for more uh, valve or problems uh, were in selected cases for prenatal intervention. Truly informed consent, this changes your practice really entirely uh, and preparations I've alluded to earlier on. You may need to involve your surgeons. Some surgeons are happier to meet par parents antenatally than others. Uh, awareness of your own results, of national results and potential complications. Delivery, I've already mentioned that local versus tertiary delivery. If you're delivering at a tertiary center, are you co-located? Co are you co-located with your obstetric facility? And neonatal involvement, i.e. what to expect when the baby is delivering. For some it's easy, duct-dependent cardiac lesions. I think well, we'd all agree that delivery at the cardiac center is preferably, or imme other immediate concerns. And a, and a really a tailored approach according to the local facilities and the individual lesion that's been identified. Do we need a full team present at delivery? Who are we going to need to have at delivery? These are the difficult questions and implications for the mode of delivery. So I think in conclusion, if you're going to manage these cases effectively, you do need a team of people, you need a variety of subspecialties. You need to make, aside from the science, a very practical preparation for, for the likely scenarios after birth. And I would advise anyone in this area to be scrupulously honest and open with regard to the diagnostic doubts or prognostic doubts in these groups. Thank you very much.